Rio Schneekner from the offshore platforms and process the Gulf Coast for the regulated interstate pipelines and compressor stations on the Transco and Gulf Stream systems before she took her current role of building gathering assets in Appalachia. Externally, Kristen's on the board of the Wyoming County United Way and presents some education and careers uh, for trade professions and other topics at numeral schools and events for students that range from the elementary level to the university level. Kristen held the role of assistant chair of the coordinating, sub coordinating the subcommittee of the Dynamic Delivery Study and Council. Um, her presentation today will focus on uh, this report that was developed for the Secretary of Energy. Uh, and this report was presented in 2019, um, so very recently. So, Kristen, I'll turn it over to you and uh, let you give your presentation. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you, Jason, and uh, the ABGPA for having me speak today. And so this is the first time I'm actually presenting over Zoom, so um, let's hope I don't screw this up. Um, so I'm about to present my screen. So let me share that. Can everybody see that? Looks good. Yes. Okay, let me go into presentation mode. There we go. So, okay. Um, first of all, um, thank you everybody um, for listening in this afternoon. Um, so I had the opportunity to be on this study um, basically all of 2018 and 2019. Um, and it was approved in December of 2019 and presented to Secretary Bruyette on his first full day of office. This study looks at uh, current infrastructure, how it has changed through the shale revolution and where it is going in the next 20 years. And many of the presentations that we give on this study are over two hours long. Um, since we only have an hour today, this is an abridged version, but please go to the MPC's website to find the full study and even more information. And with that, let's get started. And of course, I'm gonna start with a caveat, um, and that's COVID. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has introduced a heightened degree of uncertainty in the institutions that make up our country's energy production and delivery system. Over the past six months, most of the world's industrialized countries have essentially shut down their economies. As a result, demand for motor gasoline, jet fuel, and other refined products has seen an unprecedented reduction. In response, North American refineries have scaled back their operations by 30 to 40% or shut entirely. Simultaneously, this broad impact is being felt upstream and downstream in energy economies throughout the world. An ill-timed global oil market price collapse has compounded this dramatic impact, aggravating the sense of unpredictability in the oil and gas marketplace. The MPC study was completed and reported to the Secretary of Energy on December 12, 2019. Many of the outlooks in the supply and demand section were prepared in 2018 and 2019 and do not reflect current oil and gas market conditions. However, as the United States and the world emerge from the pandemic, demand for petroleum products will rebound to drive economic recovery. Even though the timing and path to economic recovery are uncertain, the oil and gas industry will undoubtedly play a central role in propelling the recovery forward. As we think of what will be needed for the oil and gas sector to thrive beyond this time of disruption and uncertainty, the findings and recommendations from this study provide insights for policymakers and business leaders to consider and act upon to the support to support the return of prosperity. So that's our COVID caveat at the moment. <laughs> um, the National Petroleum Council was established in 1946 um, at the request of President Truman. Um, the MPC is a federally chartered and privately funded advisory committee that advises the Secretary of Energy on matters related to oil and natural gas. The MPC provides advice in the form of studies with findings and recommendations relevant to public policy. Since its establishment, the MPC has prepared over 200 reports. The council membership consists of approximately 200 people and is selected and appointed by the Secretary of Energy. The council is well-balanced uh, representation with two thirds of the membership from all segments of the oil and gas industry, all sections of the country and from large and small companies and the balance from academic, financial, research, Native American and public interest organizations and institutions. The Secretary's request for the study defined the key questions and topics that should be addressed. 
provide an overview of existing infrastructure and the need for additional infrastructure to address potential changes as supply and markets develop in new locations. Review and understand any constraints and bottlenecks that could arise. In particular, constraints that might limit the industry's ability to continue to produce and grow U.S. oil and natural gas production. Technology advances that can improve the safety, resiliency, efficiency, and environmental performance of the infrastructure system. Identify regulatory or policy changes to infrastructure development and potential solutions and other emerging topics such as cybersecurity. All of these topics are significant in their own right, which is why the study required the expertise from multiple perspectives, topics, and segments within the industry. The complete report, which is over 600 pages long, plus a 50-page executive, sum executive summary, is available at www.mpc.org. You can print it out for free directly from the site or order a printed copy. The structure of the study team included the study committee, steering committee, and the coordinating subcommittee, also known as the CSC, and the study task groups. At the MPC level, there were 55 council members that were appointed to the dynamic delivery study and made up the study committee. From th that group, there were nine steering committee members engaged with the role of making sure that the efforts were adequately resourced and providing direction on more contentious issues. And you saw the list of what we were asked to do. There were quite a few contentious issues. The CSC led the devel development of the report, including defining the scope and structure, establishing the timeline, and guiding the analysis and content development. The CSC was at the helm of over 300 different study participants that were divided into four task groups, supply and demand, infrastructure mapping, analysis and resiliency, permitting, siting, and social license to operate, otherwise known as PS Slow, we love that name, um, and technology advances and deployment group. The leadership of the coordinating subcommittee included Amy Shank of Williams, myself, um, both from the Williams Company, Sean Bennett and Christopher Freitas from the DOE, and Jim Slutes from the MPC. The MPC infrastructure study included a diverse group of participants and contributors. There were over 300 study participants, including representation from most of the major oil and gas companies, transportation companies, including the pipeline, marine, rail, and trucking sectors, various government agencies, such as the Department of Energy, Department of Transportation, and state government representat representatives, Native American tribes, the consulting and financial sectors, non-government -govern organizations, labor representation, and others. Less than half the study participants work in the oil and gas business directly. The intent behind assembling such a diverse group was to allow for different perspectives to be considered and to make recommendations that allow us to move jointly ahead rather than continue to have a very divi divided perspective on how infrastructure is permitted and constructed that we all recognize is needed going forward. So let's get into the meat of the study. Factors that influence oil and natural gas production. Oil and natural gas production is shaped by several factors such as access to capital, access to resource base, the difference between the cost and price of resources, market access, government policy, and technology. The study team looked at a variety of different supply and demand outlooks which have varying assumptions about these factors to understand what impacts they would have long-term on U.S. infrastructure. The U.S. is now the largest producer of oil and natural gas in the world, and that production has provided phenomenal and historic economic, environmental, and reliability benefits. At the time that the U.S. was seeing substantial growth in oil and gas development, overall CO2 emissions decreased by 15%. This reduction is primarily due to natural gas replacing coal for electricity generation, but there's also the benefit of some technology advancements. Growth in the natural gas supply has been propelled by development in Appalachia, the Marcellus and Utica formations up in Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and Ohio. Outlooks generally project increasing U.S. natural ga gas production driven by growth in the Appalachian Basin. In the Appalachian Basin, forecasts project production to double between 2018 and 2014. U.S. crude, natural gas, and NGL's production outlooks for 2040 were collected from a number of sources for this study, including EIA, 
IHS market, BP, Rystad, Wood McKenzie, OPEC, and IEA. And as you can see from these graphs, we basically built an envelope of all of the major um, study or um, uh, production outlooks um, for uh, the last few years. And so obviously COVID has caused a blip in 2020, but we do expect these envelopes to um, continue to be true through the future. The shale revolution has been a monumental change for the industry resulting in significant shifts in the geography of supply sources and energy flows across the country. Production in the Marcellus and Utica formations in um, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and Ohio has grown from essentially zero in 2009 to about 31% of total US production in 2018. However, growth in production of oil and natural gas has been partially offset by declines in traditional production regions. Natural gas production in the Gulf of Mexico declined from 13.6 BCF per day in 2001, about 25% of the total U.S. production, to less than 4 BCF per day in 2018, less than 5% of total U.S. production. And that leads us into NGLs. The trajectory of oil and natural gas production will directly shape that of NGL production. With limited exception, the consensus for NGL supply growth is to continue. The average growth to 2040 across forecast is 1.6 million barrels per day, representing a 40% increase in total NGL production compared to 2018. By 2050, the Permian and Marcellus and Utica regions will account for more than 50% of total US NGL production. Most outlooks are consistent in anticipating that the increase in NGL production in the Marcellus and Utica plays and Permian during the next 10 years is mainly a result of the close association NGLs have with the development of crude oil and natural gas resources. So one of the standout findings of the study is that no matter what scenario, even the low carbon, high renewable scenarios, America's need for oil will remain significant and the demand for natural gas will continue well into 2040. Even in forecasts designed to meet climate challenge targets, the largest energy sources will continue to be oil and natural gas through at least 2040 to provide reliable and affordable energy. The chart in the slide compares U.S. 2018 energy consumption by type to three energy forecasts for 2040. In the second column, it's the EIA annual energy outlook, otherwise known as the AEO 2018 reference case. This Projection um, is U.S. energy demand in 2040 to be about the same as 2018, with oil declining slightly and natural gas increasing. The, IE, the third column is the IEA World Energy Outlook 2018 New Policy Scenario. And this scenario projects oil declining further than EIA's forecast and natural gas staying about the same. The fourth column um, is the IEA WEO, WEO 2018 Sustainable Development Scenario, otherwise known as the SDS. And this is often called the two degree model. Um, so many people have heard in the news and other reports um, about the two degree Celsius scenarios. This is that model um, per the IEA. Um, this forecasts a further decline in oil, near elimination of coal and increasing renewables. But even in the SDS, natural gas and oil remain the first and second largest providers of US energy in 2040. So that's one of the, the first things that we truly understood as we were gathering data. We started putting this um, you know, slide together probably mid to late 2018. Um, this was one of the biggest surprises, um, that fourth column, um, that even in the two degree scenario, um, based on, you know, the entire world's, wow, why, where are those, not sure where the lines are coming from. Sorry guys, whoops, let's go back a slide. Not sure if everybody can see those red lines on the screen. Not sure where they're coming from. Um, uh, even within, even in this scenario, um, natural gas does overtake oil, um, but even then, even putting as much policy and effort and money um, into renewables, um, they still do not overtake either natural gas or oil production. 
So with the exception of the IEA SDS case, natural gas demand is generally projected to increase over the period as electricity generators rely on natural gas to replace coal and to provide backup for increasing supplies of intermittent wind and solar power. Even in the IEA SDS case, natural gas still comprises 32% of US primary energy demand in 2040. Natural gas fire generators can quickly ramp up and down, allowing natural gas to complement increasing supplies of intermittent wind and solar power, assuring electrical grid stability and reliable supplies of electricity. In 2018, natural gas was the single largest domestic electricity generation source, comprising 34% of total US generation. More than 60% of US electricity generating capacity installed in 2018 was fueled by natural gas. Sorry, I need to take a quick sip of water. The value of infrastructure. The economic value specific to midstream infrastructure generally falls into five categories. Economic growth, job creation, increased exports, improved manufacturing competitiveness, market efficiency benefits to households and businesses. Under economic growth, Infrastructure investments has a direct impact on ec economic growth and so-called multiplier effects as the initial capacity outlay ripples through the economy. By enabling the energy sector to function efficient efficiently, midstream infrastructure supports the overall oil and gas sector, which is responsible for $1.3 trillion or 7.6% of the US GDP. 10.3 million direct, indirect and induced American jobs and $714 billion in labor income in 2015. That's all based off of PwC analysis. Job creation. Similar to the economic impacts, the construction and operation of midstream infrastructure generates direct, indirect, and induced employment. ICF International estimates that annual midstream infrastructure, pipeline and gathering spending of 22 billion per year will generate more than 325,000 US jobs per year. About one third of these jobs would be directly involved in infrastructure development and the other two thirds would be indirect or induced employment. Increased exports. The paradigm shift in US net energy trade has had large impacts on the country's overall trade deficit. EIA calculates that the total US merchandise, merchandise trade deficit in 2017 was nearly $250 billion lower than it otherwise would have been if the petroleum, otherwise, you know, otherwise known as crude oil, refined products and NGLs, trade deficit had remained at its 2007 level. Improved manufacturing competitiveness. Infrastructure and access to reliable, affordable energy are important dimensions of the competitiveness of US manufacture, manufacturing because they have helped to drive lower cost energy and raw material for manufacturers. A study by the Boston Consulting Group estimated cost savings from unconventional natural gas to be 4% or more of total manufacturing costs in a variety of industries. Due to low cost, abundant supply of natural gas and natural gas liquids, US chemical manufacturing has seen increased investment in new projects to build or expand their shale advantage capacity in the United States. Since 2010, 334 projects valued at 204 billion have been announced with more than half under construction and or having capital fully invested. Market efficiency benefits to households and businesses. The ability to use infrastructure to align supply to customer demand has led to restrained prices of electricity. Low cost natural gas supplies enabled average retail electricity prices to grow at only about 8% from 2008 to 2018, a significant reduction from the 40% uh, increase the prior decade. Consumers have benefited from a 15 plus percent decline in motor gasoline prices and energy expenditures as a share of GDP have fallen from about 10% to 6 to 8%. More infrastructure will be needed if we're going to allow these benefits to continue. So infrastructure constraints. Connecting new supply and demand centers in the future will hinge on the industry's ability to secure significant public and private investment that's needed to expand pipelines, ports, rail, and inland waterways. And I'm gonna go back a couple of slides here to this one right here. So as you can see, and let's look at the right graph, um, which is the natural gas production um, and the geographic shifts. You know, if you look at Appalachia um, and that tiny little blue bar that is 2005, and then the huge red bar that is 2018, 
this is the shale revolution and it's why infrastructure has to always be built to meet the demand the supply and demand of both oil ngls you know and natural gas of course um, our infrastructure has had to adapt to be able to handle um, our energy needs and where it's coming from. Let's go back up here. So um, when new infrastructure is delayed, bottlenecks form or worsen, such as what we're already seeing today in New England or the Port of Houston, and also in the form of export capacity limitations. These bottlenecks result in regional pricing discrepancies, fuel shortages, and the missed opportunities for all US citizens to benefit from the lowest price energy alternatives. Natural gas pipeline access in New England and New York. As Appalachian pr production grows, more pipeline capacity will be needed to bring production to market. However, pipeline construction to New York, New England, and some other regional markets has been constrained by regulatory and permitting delays, denials, public protests, political issues, and long-standing market structures. At the Port of Houston. The Port of Houston's proximity to the NGL infrastructure in Montbellu, Texas makes the Port of Houston the largest exporter of NGLs in the US. The port is also a significant container port and receives other bulk car cargoes. Congestion is significant and the need to restrict the channel to one-way traffic when very large ships enter or leave has exacerb exacerbated the issue. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is currently studying alternatives to deepen and widen the channel. On oil and, oil and natural gas export ca capability, domestic infrastructure will be required to serve both foreign waterborne crude oil imports and growing exports. These challenges will be further amplified given the concurrent expansion of export infrastructure for uh, NGL, LNG, and other associated commodities. The expected increase in exports will require dedicated export infrastructure and common infrastructure such as marine waterways and ports. The ability to produce crude oil is frequently dependent on the ability to take away the natural gas and the NGLs that are produced with crude oil. Permian Basin takeaway capacity for crude oil, natural gas, or NGLs has occasionally been constrained, leading to situations in which producers have needed to defer drilling until new capacity is built. Lack of natural gas takeaway capacity led to increased flaring of natural gas in 2019. Waivers have allowed or temporary, uh, temporary flaring for temporary flaring, but this may not uh, be possible long-term. Labor shortages and lack of specialized skill sets. Addressing labor shortages and a lack of specialized skill sets will be necessary to support future infrastructure development. As the energy sector expands, an acute skilled labor shortage is taking a toll on the oil and gas sector. A 2018 industry-wide survey by the Associated General Contractors of America determined that 80% of construction firms were having a hard time filling hourly craft positions. There is also a lack of skilled labor training of workers at the community level. In the absence of adequate supply of skilled workers in the community, projects must use transitory labor to to meet their needs, which increases the unpredictability of labor avail availability and limits direct economic benefits to the communities from job creation. Skilled trades training and apprenticeship programs will not only help build a skilled workforce on the community level, level but they will also maximize the economic earning potential for these communities. In order to maximize infrastructure value, the NBC recommends the following. Under interstate commerce, to minimize the negative impacts on interstate commerce brought by, on by friction between federal and state interests and preferences, the NPC recommends that all levels of government should engage in constructive dialogue about the overall economic benefits from the nation's energy resources. At the same time, industry must engage with stakeholders and work to minimize impacts and risks. And on labor shortages and lack of specialized skill sets, to ensure a skilled workforce is ready and able to build and maintain the infrastructure that we need, the NBC recommends that the federal government, states, secondary schools, and industry work together to promote vocational career education and advocate for registered and accredited apprenticeship programs to ensure an adequate supply of new workers. On infrastructure resiliency. Energy transportation resiliency is the ability of an infrastructure network to continue meeting demand even when portions of the network have been disrupted. 
The graphic illustrates the various supply chains that were studied and that it takes many types of infrastructure working together to provide the resilient system systems we enjoy. The shale revolution illustrates the resiliency of US oil and natural gas infrastructure. Up to now, our flexible, resilient, inter interdependent infrastructure systems have combined with technology improvements to facilitate the, the development of the tight geological, geologic formations that pre previously had been inaccessible, bringing tremendous benefits to consumers. The resiliency of the US oil and natural gas infrastructure relies on the following. The integration of various modes, pipeline, rail, trucks, and marine at multiple places and is a key characteristic that enables a high level of reliability and flexibility. A lot of people questioned why we brought in um, rail and marine and trucking experts onto the study. And it's because this intermodal dependency that we all have on each other. If there's not a pipeline available, they're often going to find a rail car that can do it, or they're going to find a truck that can do it, um, or a um, marine uh, bunker ship. So um, we all depend on each other, and it is this very um, interconnected um, way of, of keeping America, the U.S., and um, the world with energy. Storage provides resiliency at production, market, and demand centers. At demand centers, storage provides resiliency for customer consumer supply. Near the point of production, storage guards against having to shut in production should a problem occur with the transportation infrastructure. Since a short-term production shut-in can degrade the performance of a well, producers have an incentive to plan for resilient offtake. And finally, the presence of various routes enables hydrocarbons to reach their intended destinations. An example would be two pipelines, one moving crude oil directly from West Texas to the Texas Gulf Coast, and the other moving crude oil from West Texas to the large oil terminal in Cushing, Oklahoma, and joined into a pipeline moving crude oil from Cushing to the Texas Gulf Coast. In the in event of interruption to the first pipeline, crude oil supply could reach its destination via the second pipelines, assuming the alternative pipelines have sufficient available capacity. As resilient and extensive as the U.S. oil and natural gas infrastructure system has proven to be in the face of the significant changes over the past 10 to 15 years, existing infrastructure has been expanded, modified, and adapted to near maximum capacity and additional infrastructure will be needed to meet future needs. However, significant challenges exist in the permitting and siting processes, as well as with community engagement that could delay, limit, and even prevent this needed expansion. In the next section, the study team makes recommendations to improve these processes and mitigate these challenges. This is a depiction of the NEPA permitting process. I'm just gonna let this sink in for a few seconds. One of the most significant challenges to infrastructure permitting is the extremely complex set of processes involving multiple agencies at the federal and state level required to obtain approval to build new infrastructure such as natural gas pipelines. The process diagram on the slide is intended to illustrate this complexity. It has a lot of timelines, really small print, is hard to read and harder to follow. It was included in the study to highlight the key finding that overlapping and duplicative regulatory requirements inconsistencies across multiple federal and state agencies and the unnecessarily lengthy administrative pro procedures have created a complex and unpredictable permitting process. Navigating these processes has become a challenging and unpredictable endeavor, making it difficult for companies to provide, properly evaluate and plan for these investments. The regulatory framework for oil and natural gas infrastructure has its roots in the enactment of a series of laws in the 1970s including the National Environmental Policy Act, otherwise known as NEPA, the Clean Air Act, CAA, the Clean Water Act, CWA, and the Endangered Species Act. These laws, along with at least 15 others, created processes for conducting federal reviews of energy infrastructure projects. In addition to federal regulatory review of infrastructure projects and the state, exer and the state exercise of federally delegated authority, there is a wide variation in state level environmental statutes and regulations. Generally, states have adopted environmental policy acts that do not align with each other 
or with federal laws, and it is incumbent on operators to comply with such acts and keep abreast of frequent changes. Regulatory agencies remain understaffed at both the federal and the state level. Further, state budgets have contracted since the 2008 recession, which have significantly impacted on, had significant impact on recruitment and retention. And although originally expected to be concise, NEPA environmental assessments and environmental impact statements, otherwise known as EISs, have grown in length in review. A 2009 Council of Environmental Quality, otherwise known as CEQ, study analyzed the length of all the EISs in a recent five-year period across all federal agencies. The study found that final EISs average 669 pages and final appendices average more than a thousand additional pages. So there are unintended consequences. Permit, permitting challenges can delay and prevent the construction of infrastructure, which can, which can lead to a high energy, which can lead to high energy and electricity prices, constrained economic development, and lack of power reliability in periods of high demand. Infrastructure bottlenecks in the Northeast have contributed to New England consumers paying among the highest prices for electricity among the U.S. lower 48 states, and pipeline constraints causing increased energy security and economic risks as, um, sorry, pipeline constraints caused, cause increased in energy security and economic risks as illustrated by the Northeast needing to impo import foreign LNG during the winter of 2017 and 2018. Um, and if you guys will remember, that was the year that Boston had like 20 feet of snow piled up on the docks. It was a really cold winter in the Northeast and we actually had to bring an LNG tanker into Boston Harbor, a foreign LNG tanker into Boston Harbor to get them gas and keep the heat on. So let's talk about interagency coordination. The involvement of different agencies at the federal, state, and local levels can lead to inefficiencies that may delay infrastructure projects. Coordination at all levels is required to effectively manage the permitting process across the various institutions involved. MPC recommendations address local, state, and federal level interagency coordination challenges. The state and local level coordination recommend, recommendations include some state environmental policy acts, otherwise known as SEPAs, reflect heightened state standards that are more protective than NEPA review. However, most of the state level NEPA analogs operate at the same level of authority as NEPA with respect to approving or denying interstate natural gas pipeline projects. State SEPA reviews can reach different conclusions from NEPA review and can lead to denial or delay of federally approved projects. Examples include the Constitution Pi Pipeline and the Jordan Cove LNG project. Um, Jordan Cove is out in Oregon, um, if you guys don't know about that one. And also establishing a model master structure for state permitting and a single point of contact for state level permit coordination would help alleviate confusion and inefficiencies in the current process. For the state to federal coordination recommendations, states should consider leveraging their Environmental Council of States, otherwise known, otherwise known as ECOS, relationships with state officials and knowledge of the federal process to facilitate a common agreement between state and federal jurisdictions where there are potential conflicts between NEPA and SEPA review. Having states conduct concurrent reviews with the federal permitting process and comply with FAST 41 and OFD with respect to permitting timelines. And at the federal level coordination, our recommendations included multiple agencies supervise the construction of LNG facilities. Consideration and approval of plans are rarely done jointly and can result in conflicting requirements causing delay. For example, FERC, FIMSA, and the US Coast Guard inspect sites during construction and operations. These inspections overlap in scope and agencies can contradict each other and what was agreed, during, agreed to during permitting. The one federal decision, otherwise known as OFD, Memorandum of Understanding, provides a mechanism for resolving disagreements among agencies that requires initial elevation through the chain of command of each relevant agency and encourages resolution of disputes in a consistent manager, manner. And finally, preparing a single multi-agency permitting timetable with specific concurrence points ensures early and continued interagency coordination during the process. So in other words, it's complicated, guys, and uh, it really needs to be leaned out if anybody uh, likes lean. 
um, out there. So, okay, stakeholder engagement. Stakeholders include individuals, state and local governments, and organizations that can affect or be affected by infrastructure development and operation. Private citizen stakeholders may include affected landowners, farmers and ranchers, small business owners, and local community leaders and individuals. The study group held sev several listening sessions with public interest groups, private citizens, and local government represent representatives. The study group also reviewed public comments submitted by those groups on infrastructure projects, as well as experience related by study group members, including companies, American Indians, Alaska Natives, academia, and public interest groups. So we actually talked to um, about 20 tribes and we brought in landowners and other people that have been uh, related with some of the projects that were um, canceled or denied. Um, and we really tried to get to the root cause of um, what they were thinking and what we could do about it to make projects uh, easier to go through. Regulatory processes at all levels of government furnish opportunities for stakeholders to provide input to the permitting process. Recognizing the importance of public involvement in the transparency of regulatory decisions, stakeholder acceptance can, acceptance can influence if a project goes forward or gets delayed. The key concerns identified through the listening sessions and additional research are outlined in the slide. Addressing these concerns will require working closely with the relative, relevant stakeholders to ensure infrastructure projects can move forward. Early engagement is considered key to a project's likelihood of approval. In addition to identifying and addressing issues that stakeholders might raise as objections later in the design process, gathering public input in the pre-filing process creates an early record that could speed agency approval. Failure to establish effective stakeholder engagement processes can lead to increased tensions and conflict among, stakes, among stakeholders, as well as hamper industry social and license to operate. If a company or industry loses the social license, the legal license to operate can be jeopardized as well. Target education and outreach to these, uh, target education and outreach to these need, to the needs and of diverse audiences. Provide materials and strategies to reach non-English speaking populations for those who do not under, not use the, un, in, sorry about that guys. I've been talking a while, let me take a sip of water. Be able to talk again. So we need to target education and outreach to the needs of diverse audiences. We need to provide materials and strategies to reach non-English speaking populations and for those who do not use the internet or have limited education audiences, et cetera. And finally, implement existing best practices for early and effective engagement. Work collectively toward more effective engagement practices regarding energy, environmental, and related public policies that encourage responsible energy development and transport. So the permitting and climate change findings. One set of stakeholders that have been increasingly active are those that connect the development of oil and natural gas infrastructure with the negative impacts on climate. The MPC recognizes the dual challenge of providing affordable energy while addressing the risk of climate change. While the MPC shares the concern that climate change is a serious issue requiring action, fighting individual projects in the courts is an ineffective way to achieve change. NEPA has become a leading basis for litigation and challenging agency decisions on energy infrastructure. The uncertainty over NEPA interpretation has led to expanded reviews and delays in permitting. Comments filed by citizens in opposition to many infrastructure projects suggest that many who contest new infrastructure do so out of the belief that the nation will not take other effective measures to achieve GHG emission reductions. Federal agencies NEPA reviews are typically thorough and generally upheld. And these have had a, an 80% success rate in litigation. The main NEPA interpretation issue is the litigation um, on whether FERC in assessing the environmental impacts of a particular project must include one, greenhouse gas emissions upstream of a project from an increase of production to support an infrastructure project, otherwise known as drilling, or two, emissions downstream of a project from the use of the fuel transported by the infrastructure. So one of the first wins of this study um, and some guidance that's already come out from the CEQ is that uh, they have proposed rulemaking to modernize and improve NEPA regulations to better 
align with the goal set forth in Executive Order 13807 on infrastructure permitting. The proposed rulemaking includes several recommendations proposed by the MPC, such as clarifying the, def the definition of environmental effects of a proposed action, requiring a joint schedule for reaching decisions, steps to make the process more efficient, such as establishing time limits and page limits for the co completion of environmental impact statements and environmental assessments, and strengthening the role of the lead federal agency in requiring timely res resolution disputes. Okay, now we get into the actual recommendations from the MPC. Recommendations to address the topic of climate change will require leadership and action from both industry and government. To that end, the MPC recommend, recommends all oil and gas infrastructure companies should strive for outstanding environmental compliance records and continue to work to reduce GHG emissions from their operations. The study highlights several programs that illustrate industry's commitment in this area. Some of these are listed on the slide. Due to the uncertainty in interpretation, Congress should clarify that GHG assessments under NEPA are confined to emissions that are one, proximately caused and causally related by the federal action, and two, reasonably foreseeable. Congressional action adopting a comprehensive policy to reduce economy-wide GHG emissions could help alleviate the issues stemming from the patchwork of local, state, regional, and sector-specific GHG policies and the concerns of environmentally focused stakeholders, thus minimizing the need for litigation. So the formal recommendation reads, Congress should enact a comprehensive national policy to reduce GHG emissions and harmonize federal, state, and sectoral policies. The policy should be economy-wide, applicable to all sources of emissions, market-based, transparent, predictable, technology agnostic, agnostic, and internationally competitive. Now we are going into the technology section. Some of the concerns expressed by stakeholders in the infrastructure permitting process are related to the safety and environmental impacts of oil and natural gas infrastructure. Technology combined with robust safety and operations integrity management systems have already led to significant improvements in these areas and will continue to do so. That is why the last topic addressed by the study team was technology advances in deployment for oil and gas uh, infrastructure. Through the hard work of over 100 individuals that contributed to the technology advancements and deployment chapter of the study, we verified that what we already knew, that oil and natural gas arrives at its destination with a high degree of safety, reliability, and environmental performance nearly 100% of the time. But incidents have happened and we, we can do better. The oil and gas infrastructure companies are dedicated to continuous improvement and are working to find a path to zero. The chart on the left illustrates key trend data on crude oil spills by transportation mode. In March 2019, the Department of Transportation issued a report to Congress on the delivery performance of shipping crude oil transported by truck, rail, marine, and pipeline, which showed that over a 10-year period through 2016, crude oil transported by these modes safely reached its destination more than 99.999% of the time. That third nine was very important. To put what this means to deliver 99.999% uh, of the time into everyday con context, it is the equivalent to an error rate of 1 in 100,000. Oil and natural gas transportation companies focus on, is now on addressing the remaining 0.001% to eliminate incidents. A quick note on, on spills from crude by rail in 2013 and 2015. These are the green bars on the chart. Um, between 2012 and 2016, crude oil volumes by rail increased significantly from, from prior years. During three of those five years, crude oil by rail safely reached its destination 99.999% of the time. During two of the years, performance declined due to low prob probability but significant events. And so if we go back to um, the uh, interconnectedness of all the systems that are needed for infrastructure. And think of the oil coming out of the Bakken. Because the pipelines were not built yet, they put the oil on rail. And so there was a huge spike in transportation by rail of oil, um, especially from 2012 to 2016. 
and, and that's when these two um, years where, where they had a couple of accidents did happen. Um, so, but it just goes to, if there's not a pipeline, they're gonna find a way to get the resource um, as long as it's at all economically viable and they can get the permits to do, um, do it out of the region. So according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, petroleum refinery, fining, petrochemical manufacturing, uh, pipeline and rail transportation continue to provide some of the safest workplaces compared to all other private industries listed and much safer than the private industry average. Analysis shows that the majority of incidents result in part from human and organizational factors. Strengthening safety management systems, advancing and deploying technologies, and creating a more adaptive and performance-based regulatory framework could accelerate safety performance improvements. In the next few slides, I will provide a more detailed overview of the study recommendations for each mode of transport. So we're going to start with pipeline technologies. Although pipelines have an impressive safety record, additional areas exist to improve safety operational and environmental performance in the industry. Four categories of causes, corrosion, excavation damage, natural forest damage, i.e. Uh, geohazards, and pipe weld failures contribute to approximately 75% of all volume released from pipelines. Research and development improvements across safety management systems, inline inspection tools, geospatial data analysis and sharing coding systems and methane emissions may reduce future pipeline incidents. Um, and I just looked at my watch guys because we are running out of time and I wanna make sure there's a few minutes for, for questions. So um, there is a lot more on the pipeline technologies, um, but you guys can see here, we look at tons of different technology, everything from pigging to welding um, and materials. Um, and there's a ton of papers, white papers in the study um, that uh, can give you more information on these because I wanna get to one last subject. Um, so other than the re regulatory, so we're gonna do two more subjects, sorry about that. Uh, regulatory barriers to technology deployment. Right now, um, some of the um, ways that FIMSA approves technology, um, you have to like prove the technology before they'll ever even let you try the technology. Um, and so there are some recommendations on, um, you know, working on pilot programs um, and things to allow for an agile pathway um, to get new technology to uh, market and for there to be a cost recovery. And then the final subject I want to talk about today um, before we get to a few minutes of questions is cybersecurity. This was the elephant in the back of the room um, when we started. Um, we didn't understand what we were getting into with cyber threats um, and no understanding the, um, the true threat that it is. Um, but cyber threats um, to control our systems are increasing due to greater reliance on control technologies to manage risk and optimize assets. Additional connectivity to business systems and increasing instances of cyber activity targeting industrial control systems um, is, is definitely happening. Um, and so cybersecurity um, is going to be a big one. And the DOE um, and the DOJ have teams um, stood up at this time to um, really look at cybersecurity and keep on top of that. So, and there are a couple of more cybersecurity recommendations. Um, again, uh, increased government support um, and really looking at our cybersecurity management standards and um, have an information sharing and analysis center to promote uh, information sharing. So, and R&D, of course, so. Okay, we made it through that, guys. Um, so I'm going to do this and flip back over to here. Yeah. Stop sharing and I'm gonna start my video. So you guys, am I on mute? I don't think I'm on mute, okay. No, we so, so, okay, sorry about that guys. So getting used to Zoom. Um, what questions do you have in the last five minutes? And I apologize, there was a lot to get through there. Hi, Kristen. Uh, this is Dave McCauley with G2 Integrate Solutions. I have a question for you. Great presentation, by the way. Thank you. Um, the, uh, I read recently that um, EPA um, rolled back uh, some of the regulations on methane emissions recently. 
And um, we, we know that if there's a change in administration, those will probably be put back in place or, or whatever. But I also read that a lot of the majors like BP and others, basically um, they've already put it out there that their, their uh, requirements are even more stringent than what the regulations would have uh, required. What, what do you think is driving that push by the industry to be in a lot of the, the major oil and gas companies uh, to be even more um, stringent on that? Because um, we've seen that happen in other industries as well. I could wish I could say it was uh, anything. Well, there's a little, there's a couple of factors in that. Um, there is some, you know, people are, you know, understanding climate change and um, understanding where the world is going. But the bigger issue is ESG and investment dollars. And so they know that they're not going to get investment dollars and they're going to lose shareholders unless their environmental safety and governance um, policies are up to snuff to the world standards. And so um, that's driving most of it at this point in time. Um, so, but as we, and, and Williams has an ESG also, so we are striving and we are above and beyond those um, regulations already also. Um, and so uh, as we get forward and everybody gets running with their ESG um, more than they are today, like all those ESGs are just coming out now. Um, Williams uh, just uh, published their second um, ESG this uh, about a month ago. Um, so as everybody gets truly running with those, I think you're going to see a momentum building uh, behind just, this is the right way to do it. We're gonna do it right, let's go. So it doesn't matter um, if the EPA pulls back um, the, the regulations. Okay, thank you. Y'all now know I am a serious Diet Dr. Pepper fan. What other questions do you guys have? Hey, Chris, this is Jason. Um, back where you were discussing the percentages uh, uh, for future um, sources of energy in the nation, and where you were talking about the bar chart that had the two degree um, chart, is what you called it, on the end there. Yep, the um, SDS, where, the IEA SDS case? Yep, yep. Um, we saw a reduction in the percentage of oil and natural gas uh, making up the 100% uh, energy uh, demand. However, um, we should see an increase in energy demand over those next 20 years, too. So Is the SD an overall demand for oil and natural gas, or did it actually increase even though the percentage has decreased? So under the SDS case, um, the reduction in actual demand comes from efficiencies. So uh, to get to, to the SDS, not only do you need to switch your form of energy to a cleaner source, um, you also have to make everything much more efficient. So um, everything from battery technology to solar panel technology, all of it has to become a, 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 your toaster, you know, needs to be more efficient. Your oven needs to be more efficient. So a lot of that actually comes from efficiencies in the end product that is using the demand. And so um, that's why there's actually a reduction in demand um, and then the, the percentages within their change. So there is actually a reduction and the amount of energy expected. Uh, yes. Okay. Yep. We have to be more efficient to meet that one, according okay. to IEA, EI, IEA. I always switch those two up. Got it. Thank you for the clarification. Yes. Guys, you can't let me off this easy. Okay. Well, hearing none. Jason, I'm gonna. Say we got time for maybe one more. Um, is there a brave soul, soul out there? I don't know. I may have been talking too fast. 
No, I, it was it was great, Kristen. I, I really do appreciate it. And, and as Kristen mentioned at the beginning of the call, um, you know, this stuff is publicly available for, for download. So um, I would advise everyone to go out and, and take a look at the full report and and listen to the, the podcast and other things that are about this. It's pretty interesting stuff. So, um, and of course, this presentation will also be made available for, for download as part of the ABGPA conference. So, um, yeah, well, with that, I, I, um, I, you know, thank you, Chris. And it doesn't appear that we have anything else coming in here at the moment. So, um, really appreciate your time and, and, you know, walking us through that, that pretty complex, uh, flow chart and everything else that went along with it. So, um, thank you. Again.